Legendary anti-war activist Tom Hayden died Sunday in Santa Monica, California, after a lengthy illness. He was 76 years old. Tom Hayden spent decades shaping movements against war and for social justice. In the early 60s, he was the principal author of the Port Huron Statement, the founding document of Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS. The statement advocated participatory democracy and helped launch the student movement of the 60s. Tom Hayden was also a freedom rider in the Deep South and helped create a national poor people's campaign for jobs and empowerment. He also organized in Newark, New Jersey, among his books Rebellion in Newark, Official Violence and Ghetto Response. In 1968, Tom Hayden became one of the so-called Chicago Eight. He was convicted of crossing state lines to start a riot after he helped organize protests against the Vietnam War outside the Democratic National Convention. In 1982, Hayden entered electoral politics, first winning a seat in the California State Assembly, later in the California Senate. We turn now to a speech Tom Hayden gave last year at a conference in Washington, D.C., titled Vietnam, The Power of Protest. I want to start off by saying how many of you uh, I love very much and known for such a long time, and um, I, I only hope that there's enough uh, minutes and occasions here for us to get to know each other again, because we have really been through a lifetime. Um, today we'll have uh, plenty of time for discussion, for panels, for observations, and at 4 o'clock, uh, will gather to march to the King Memorial. And I want to just say a word about that. I know that uh, Ron Dellums is going to speak to this. But wh why, was that, wh why was that chosen? Uh, it's because in keeping with trying to make, make sure our history is told accurately, uh, we have to tell it ourselves. And we have to recognize that uh, Dr. King became a martyr because of his stand on Vietnam not only because of his stand on uh, race, justice, uh, economic uh, poverty. Uh, and there's been a tendency over the many decades to, uh, uh, to make Dr. King a, a monument to nonviolence alone. And we need to remember that he was um, attacked uh, by the New York Times and by the Wall Street Journal and by the Washington Post uh, for being out of place. They wanted to put him back in his place uh, and say nothing about Vietnam, take no stand on Vietnam. There were threats uh, that he would lose funding. Uh, there were threats um, of all sorts. And uh, <clears throat> to distort that, to forget that, to ignore that his monument would be shaped in a certain way to serve certain interests, but not others, is a disservice to truth, uh, and we have to march there uh, and vigil there and commemorate him as a, as a leader uh, uh, and a martyr for all of us, for peace, justice, and civil rights, not only in the United States, but around the world, and persist in making sure that his whole story, including the uh, the campaign to end poverty in the United States is told each and every year and in all of our schools and curriculum. So that's the purpose. This is a way of saying that the struggle for uh, memory and for history is a living thing. It's uh, ongoing. It does not end. Uh, even today, people are debating and reassessing the history of uh, abolition of slavery the role of slave resistance, the role of the Underground Railroad, the role of the abolitionist direct action movement, the role of the radical Republican politicians, the role of international politics in what came about, and the role, how it was derailed by the assassination of President Lincoln. The ending of the possibilities of Reconstruction, which were not taken up again until 1960, and the coming of Jim Crow. Uh, each generation has to, has to wrestle with the history of what come bef comes bef came before and, and, and ask whose interest does this history serve, 
Uh, how does it advance a legacy of, of uh, social movements? How does it deny that legacy? We don't know. And, but we do know that we are here for the very first time uh, as such a broad gathering of the movement against the Vietnam War. It's been 50 years since Selma, 50 years since the first SDS march. So it was a time that changed our lives, nearing a second reconstruction before the murders of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy. Then came the budget cuts, the end of the war on poverty. Then came the Watergate repression, and we became a generation of might have beens. Like Sisyphus, our rock lay at the bottom of the hill. We gather here to remember the power that we had at one point, the power of the peace movement, and to challenge the Pentagon now on the battlefield of memory. We have to resist their military occupation of our minds and the minds of future generations. <laughs> memory. Memory is very much like rock climbing, the recovery of memory. Each niche towards the summit is grasped inch by bleeding inch and has to be carefully carved with tools that are precise in order to take the next step. Falling back is always possible. But as Dr. King himself said on his last night, there is something in humans that makes us aspire to climb mountains, to reach that majesty if only for a moment. We are mountain climbers. President Obama has reminded us to uh, remember, he said, Selma, Seneca Falls, and Stonewall. But not Saigon, not Chicago, <clears throat> not Vietnam. We have to ask ourselves collectively why that omission exists and realize that only we can restore a place in the proper history of those times. We suspect that there was a reason that it has to do with the programming of amnesia, that there are very powerful forces in our country who stand for denial not just climate denial, but generational denial, Vietnam denial. There are forces that stand for ethnic cleansing, but not just ethnic cleansing, but also for historic cleansing. And that is what has happened. Um, it serves their purpose because they have no interest in the true history of a, of a war in which they sent thousands to their death, and almost before the blood had dried, were moving up the national security ladder and showing up for television interviews to advertise what they called the next cakewalks. Only, only the blood was caked. There came a generation of career politicians who were afraid of association with the peace movement, who were afraid of being seen as soft, who saw that the inside track was the track of war. Our national forgetting is basically uh, pathological. Our systems, politics, media, culture, are totally out of balance today because of our collective refusal to admit that the Vietnam War was wrong and that the peace movement was right. In the, in the absence... In the absence of an established voice for peace in all the institutions, the neoconservatives will, will fill the foreign policy vacuum. Am, am I right? Will they not? Will they not advise both parties? Uh, I think, though, that American public opinion has shifted to a much more skeptical state of mind than earlier generations, but the spectrum of American politics and media has not. So we can never forget that, of course, it was the Vietnamese resistance and their sacrifice that led to our awakening, along with the civil rights movement at home. It, it began with handfuls of young people, 
black students who led freedom rides, sit-ins, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was the first to resist the war. Julian Bond, who's sitting here, was rejected after being elected to the Georgia legislature. Muhammad Ali was stripped of his boxing titles. It also began with the Vietnam Day Committee in Berkeley, growing out of teach-ins, out of SDS that called the First March, the draft resistance, there had never been a peace movement like the one in 1965 that arose out of the civil rights movement and came just weeks after Selma. At least 29 would die at the hands of police while demonstrating for peace. And I'd like here to introduce uh, Luis Rodriguez and Ros Rosalia Munoz and Jorge Mariscal from the Chicano Moratorium where four died, including Gustav Montes, Lynn Ward, Jose Diaz, and Ruben Salazar. <laughs> Ruben Salazar was an early Juan Gonzalez. Ruben Salazar was a great reporter for the Los Angeles Times, who served as a journalist in Vietnam before he started critical reporting on the streets of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and he was shot by the sheriff's deputies. I don't know if he's here, but um, uh, is uh, Alan Canfora here? Alan, please stand. Alan is, was wounded at Kent State. Four died at Kent State, two at Jackson State two weeks later. Uh, and every year, in these two groups of uh, people have observed memorials, have fought for their place in history, uh, are coming up on their 50th anniversary commemorations and are here today to learn from us as we've learned from them the importance of organizing, organizing, organizing around the politics of memory. Uh, so thank you for being here uh, and um, we will remember, we will not forget. We will not forget the eight who sacrificed their lives by self-immolation. We will not forget the students who uh, uh, helped end the war by shutting down so many campuses. We will not forget the veterans who took the risk of standing up to their commanding officers and resisted from within the military. Uh, we will not forget this because this was uh, something like uh, Du Bois' characterization of the uh, general strike by slaves who, through non-cooperation, walked off plantations across the South when they saw the futility of any other alternative and chose to simply walk away and join the Union Army. What happened at the end of the Vietnam War is that people walked away. The campuses shut down. Four million students walked away. The military was described by Marine colonels in military histories as being on the verge of collapse. They walked away. The counterculture walked away. Uh, we all walked away. It might have been otherwise if King and Robert Kennedy had not been assassinated, we might have been united at least for a moment, at least for a moment. We might have elected a president, we might have ended a war, but instead we were relegated to wondering what might have been. We lost any basis for our unity, and thus we have not come together since that time. The question for us is whether Today, we can unify when we never could unify before. Can we do that for the memory of our movement and for the meaning that it holds for future generations? I hope so. I pray so. Thank you. Legendary civil rights and anti-war activist Tom Hayden, speaking last year in Washington, D.C., and the 50th anniversary of the first major anti-Vietnam War protest. It was a conference called Vietnam, the Power of Protest. 
Tom Hayden died Sunday at the age of 76 in California. You can go to democracynow.org to watch all of our interviews with Tom, including a discussion about participatory democracy from Port Huron to Occupy Wall Street. You can also see our interview with him about his last book called Listen Yankee, Why Cuba Matters. Yes.